Good evening, everybody, and welcome. My name is Rhonda Rosen, and I am the Programming and Exhibition Librarian here in the Hannon Library. On behalf of our entire outreach team, welcome to Virtual Faculty Pub Night. Tonight's Faculty Pub Night will feature Dr. Nina Lozano, Associate Professor of Communication Studies. Dr. Lozano is going to discuss her recent publication, Not One More, from the Nitsidio on the Border. Before we begin, I would like to remind you all that Faculty Pub Night is the library's opportunity to shine a spotlight on our faculty's accomplishments for our students, staff, faculty, and during COVID for anyone who has Zoom. So please spread the word. Some ground rules for tonight. We will be recording this evening's presentation and it will be available on the library's YouTube channel. After Professor Lozano's presentation, I will have a short one-on-one -on -one conversation with her and then we will open it up to questions from the audience. If you have a question for our speaker during the presentation, you are welcome to submit it by using the Q&A function on the bottom of your screen. All questions will be compiled by our outreach team and submitted to our speaker as time permits. So, Dr. Nina M. Lozano is a political consultant and associate professor of communication studies. Her areas of expertise include rhetoric, social movements, gender, and politics. She is a former Carnegie Fellow and is a regular contributor to the Huffington Post and other political websites. Dr. Lozano has written numerous publications in the field of communication studies. The book she is discussing tonight was part of the special series, New Directions in Rhetoric and Materiality, published by Ohio State University Press. So please join me in welcoming Dr. Nina Lozano to Faculty Pub Night to discuss her recent publication, Not One More, The Minicidio on the Border. I'm very excited to be here. Um, I'm going to begin. I don't have much time this evening to talk because we really want to have a, a, a rigorous Q&A and also um, a one on one discussion with Rhonda. So what I'm going to do is talk a little bit about my research and then we'll open it up for questions. So currently my research looks at the concept of femicide, the killing of women and girls, simply because they are women and girls. So feminicidio in Ciudad Juarez is my research. Juarez is a town on the border of El Paso, Texas, and it has really been ground zero for the work looking at social movements and their attempts to end gendered violence. And so my work took me across the border since 2003. My book is a compilation of 17 years of research. And I wanted to um, begin by paying tribute to the mothers and the activists um, by reading this line to open us up and get us in a space to think about this. I should also give folks a trigger warning that we will be talking about gendered violence and some um, details pertaining obviously to the concept. So if you ever feel like you need to leave the Zoom or um, obviously um, please take care of your, your mental health first. So justice in Juarez, to Juarez they will come. The women will walk, they will fight, justice will come. They will shout not one more. They will shout not one more. These lyrics really are the soul of what's been happening on the ground with the women in Juarez. And so I thought I'd start just with some brief testimony of the mother of the disappeared women in Juarez. I am Carmen Venegas of Justicia para Nuestras Hijas, mother of Miriam Gallegos Venegas. She was 17 years old and worked for the Maquila. She never came home that day. Esmeralda Herrera Monreal was found dead in a cotton field. 
clothes bloodied, body bloated and purple, and her face missing. She had also been raped. So there are many, many documented testimonies in my book. Um, I just wanted to spotlight a few of the struggle to be heard and to be seen and attempting to give voice to the voiceless through this project. So in doing my book, I took a theoretical position that I won't speak much about today because it takes us off track, um, but I critique this concept of new materialism, which essentially gives focus on objects and things. That has become a turn in my discipline to look at objects and things as having agentic property, meaning that there's something about these objects that can give life or are constitutive of other meanings. And so I argue that when we're looking at gendered violence and objects, we need to take a Marxist position and return back to the notion that materiality and lived experiences and the background of capitalism is what frames how these objects move and interact with bodies, in particular women. And so I use the term femicide, which was originally coined in 1992, but in Spanish, it didn't, it only translated to homicide. So we use the term now scholars and activists as feminicidio in order to have the, the label gendered. So I mentioned my critique of new materialism, which is a post-humanistic turn. So I argue essentially that when women and bodies are dying, we can't take a turn away from the lived that we must have a focus on bodies, experiences, and grounded in a framework of the background that gives rise to femicide in the first place. So I offer an alternative called border materialism, which is a theoretical framework that offers scholars a lens to examine how object-oriented things and matter intersect with bodies rooted in neoliberal economic structures within specific geographical boundaries mediated by human agency for political change. So this is my, my primary theoretical lens. I'm looking at borders, I'm looking at bodies, I'm looking at economic structures in order to understand the conditions surrounding the feminicidios. I view myself as a scholar activist. And so I argue that when doing work that there should be a scholarly commitment to render sense making of the material object of studies, meaning being in the field, being with the families, being with the activists. So I've worked alongside them for almost two decades and that, that, that scholar activist position has to be earned and trust has to be formed within that community in order to tell the stories. So my book spans a long period of time. I demarcate uh, different waves of feminicidio documented in the book um, all the way through the present. I looked at three mothers groups that have led the movements in their calls for justice. And these women, the mothers we should note, are the ones that started the movement to begin with. There have been many marches and protests that I study. This was a caravan for justice where there were speaking tours from Canada the United States and Latin America. Motherist activism is a term from Cynthia Bejarano that talks about the importance of gender and bodies in making arguments for change in the public sphere. And so the mothers have been the face of this movement from the beginning. So there are many different strategies that the government has um, um, what's the word I'm looking for, they've implemented in order to shut down the rhetoric of the mothers. And so um, I'm going to skip through that section and just try to give you a little bit of overview on the chapters before the Q&A. Um, but it is really important to understand why the government wants to silence the mothers. They don't want bad publicity that a femicide exists. They call femicide a dark legend. And so in order for them to silence the mothers, I trace all the ways that the mothers have resisted and each chapter takes on a different rhetorical strategy. So the first chapter, Feminicidio and the Enchanted Assemblages of Things, looks at the pattern of women who have been killed that work in the maquiladoras, the factories, and how NAFTA, the free trade agreements, provide safety for the corporations 
but not for the women themselves. And so when you think about this chapter, I think about the US culpability. This is not just a Mexico problem. These free trade agreements involve the United States and many of the maquilas are owned by United States investors. I look at how bodies become disposable through capital, how the mothers disrupt gendered norms, and how the reassemblage of things can have a, a positive effect within those communities. So this is a photo of the free trade zone. You can see there's walls, there's lights, there's security, there's grass. And then when you look at this picture and juxtapose it, this is the town of Anapra when men, where many of the women work in the maquilas in the night shift so they can be with their children in the morning. And they have to walk from the maquila with no roads, no pavement, no lights, no security. Um, and so the, you can see the corporations are protected but not the workers and the women themselves. One way that um, the women and the activists have been trying to change the, the dominant discourse that a femicide doesn't exist is by looking at how monuments and rhetorical artifacts can serve as protest, but also in relation to the collective imagination of public memory. And so this chapter looks at the monuments that have been set up by the mothers painting the crosses throughout the city painting crosses where bodies have been found to demarcate warnings to them, but also to, ex to exert that the femicide is real. This one here has an image of a cross, which is a symbol of the movement right in front of the one of the government offices. So if the bodies can't be there, these serve as warning signs. They also take everyday objects and reimagine them for the femicide purpose of raising awareness. So here, I think this is so powerful in a shopping center. Instead of trying to find a directory of where to perhaps find a pair of shoes, instead, the public is looking at this image of a lost, disappeared woman. This is Esmeralda. She's on the cover of the book. And so I, I examine how everyday objects can be transferred into sites for collective memory and for protest. I call that practiced matter. I also have a chapter on the murals that have been done for the women, um, again, attempting to raise awareness. And it's important to note that when you look at a, the murals, I do an analysis of the murals by the activists, this one here, that tells their stories, shows their lives, exerts that they were real bodies, whereas the Mexican government's murals are almost like an assembly line. They're always the same, just a few roses and a few um, words, but nothing about their lived stories, et cetera. And so I do a critique of the government murals in relation to the murals of the activists. I argue that affect can be utilized in order to promulgate members in movements. And so the last chapter I'll highlight before the Q&A is probably, I think, the most powerful chapter. If we remember what I just said earlier about critiquing objects and new materialism, one of the things that the family members do is look for bodies because the government does not do their job. And so this is a caravan I participated in to go out into the desert and look for remains. These are citizen action committees. And what I argue is, against new materialism is let's say we find these bones of a victim there's no inherent property about that there's nothing that alone it can act to enact change you need human mediation because oftentimes the bones that are collected by the mexican government um, are not cataloged correctly um, they lose them they falsify evidence and so the citizen action committees have taken it upon themselves to begin cataloging categorizing and cataloging the bones of the victim. This is Esmeralda's father as he's out looking for Esmeralda. Whenever we found something, we put up a red flag so we could go back and look at the, the scene um, afterward. And so I argue that matter, things have to be, rhetoric has to be utilized to make matter matter to the public. So after the search, we had a press conference with mothers and activists and fathers and scholars speaking out about the femicides and against the government's attempt to downplay them. And so when the mother's discourse circulates, they perform, I argue, radical 
rearticulations, here using Butler's work, which bodies come to matter. The mother's rhetoric functions to refashion the cultural logic of femicide while countering the dominant hegemony of the state and popular culture. So where are things now? It's really difficult to organize because of the narco wars. Um, it's still not safe to go to war as we stopped taking students at LMU in 2009 um, because of the risk of the narco violence. But the demands continue to stop impunity. And this is an image of the cotton field where many of the bodies have been found. And so I argue that you can never stop talking about it. I will never stop talking about Olga. I cannot stop until the violence stops. Every time I tell my story, I relive my daughter's death, but I cannot stop. Arguing that there is a femicide, it is real. Future actions that are being organized are important in making change in the structures and categories surrounding feminicidio. Currently in the state of Chihuahua, feminicidio is not a legal category. That is a huge problem changing culture norms, we need more international pressure and continuing looking at border issues and capitalism that gives rise to femicide in the first place. So I'll end it there because I really wanna have a robust Q&A and discussion and um, I will turn it back over to Rhonda at this point. Okay, um, you know, when I read your book, it, it, it was just so horrifying, such a horrible topic, and it's it just amazing how people can be so insensitive on such a large level, a large scope. Um, and just on a personal note, when I was reading, you know, the, the, the function is really to never forget, and that reminded me a lot of the Jewish people and the Holocaust, and that has always been their message is never forget. And it's, it's just so, so, so hard, so hard to deal with as a woman. Um, I'm not a mother, but I can't even imagine how I would feel knowing this story as a mother. And I just thank you for your work. Thank you very much for all of your activism. It's, it's really fabulous. Um, so let's get some questions. Okay, so, um, what situations make either materialist or discursive theory more important or more useful in solving the problem of the ongoing feminicidio? That is a fantastic question. So I, I argue that materiality must go hand in hand with rhetorical strategies um, because the rhetoric circulates and permeates the public sphere. That's what we study as rhetoricians. And so if the newspapers and the government officials are saying this is a dark legend, we must have counter discourse to then counter that rhetoric. And so through the murals and through the um, reconfiguring of matter, through the searches, um, it takes rhetoric to counteract that and change the message. And that's really the ongoing rhetorical struggle between the mothers and the state. Amazing. Um, okay, you ready? Do you feel that a change in US policy or administration will make a difference in what is happening on the border? So thank you. So uh, initially when we were taking our LMU students, you know, especially when looking at the Maquila Doras and the factories, the first thing that came to mind was we need to boycott until there are changes that are made. Um, and then when we had our conversation with the workers, um, they said, no, do not boycott because we need these jobs. We yeah. need the income. And so it, it was a lesson for us to always be present and listening to the community members on the ground and always following their lead in solidarity in these action items. Because, you know, as uh, you, why well, I'm a dual citizen, but living in the US, um, we may not have a clear understanding of the Mexican constitution, of how this works. Um, but I talk a lot about the U.S. culpability in relation to the Maquilas um, in that there can be changes for safety for the women, and that's really what they're arguing for change yeah. for. And that doesn't seem like that's asking a lot either. I mean, it just seems like that's fundamental, and it's, it's sad. It's very sad. 
Well, yeah, that's why I think those images of the corporation versus yeah. the city are so stark. And I wanted to show that yeah. um, juxtaposition. Yeah, it's shocking. I mean, it's truly shocking. And oh, it makes you angry inside. <laughs> yes, yes, it does. Um, okay, so what are the some what are some of the most interesting critiques of your work that you've read or encountered, and then how do you respond to them? Well, I have folks on the on the new materialist camp that think that my reading is too hard on objects and and affect, um, the, you know. But as a Marxist, I, I think with you know to me that they critique that perhaps. Um, I'm too reductionistic in, in looking at what they have to offer. Um, but I contend when you're looking at things like femicide, um, you must look at the context. You must look at um, the cultural and social and political and economic conditions that give rise to femicide. And so I, I, I try to deflect that in looking at how my research takes that up almost as a test a theoretical test. And so um, hopefully my work in the later chapters function to answer those critiques. So one of the questions that, that I had um, before we drew up our que questions was, and you sort of made reference to it in that, and my question was, why? Is it just that with the machismo of the Mexican culture that women are just disposable? Or is there some sort of message that that is being said or why why is this there's so it's so complex you know it's so and you know in the beginning i didn't talk about this in my talk but when the feminist studios started to get attention hollywood actually jumped on this immediately um and wanted to create these whodunit kind of you know and so i, I document those books in my in my book um and so you know, that the, the mothers were then fighting against these falsified depictions in the media and Hollywood and also the government. And so you have large discourses to fight against. And also in the Makila setting, if a woman, you know, is fired because of NAFTA and the loss of jobs from people having to migrate to northern Mexico, there's just another body, right? There's just another body that can fill that position. And so I argue that there's this notion of women and disposability. Um, and also the rhetoric is important. So when women work at a maquila, the rhetoric around that woman is that she is prostituting herself by working outside of the home. And so to call these women prostitutes who are working in factories um, makes it even more difficult because they view these women, right, as disposable, as you know, they use the rhetoric of they they were on the wrong side of the tracks. They were asking for it. I mean, all those discourses we see here, mm -hmm. you know, and we have to remember femicide is a global issue, um, you know. So I try to look at all those factors um, and how they've been uh, played out in Juarez, um, then in relation to the strategies. So, yeah. And are they always single women? Most of the time, single and young women. Okay, yeah. yeah. Uh, okay. Um, and I should say too that there's an economic, you know, tra human trafficking, there's an yeah. economic, there's a picture in my book where there's a brothel that the mothers believe many of the girls have been forced into right in the downtown area of Warwick. Um, and also I should mention the narco um, aspect of it because killing women for the nar narco um, groups is a form of initiation. So there's also that the huge fight against the narcos and the killing of women for initiation. Um, I cite one instance where one of the, the members of the cartel, um, they wear the nipples of the women that they've killed as a sign that they've, you know, they've Ew. initiated, you know, so there's so much, there's so many factors that are all layered and interconnected. Oh, okay, um, I'm gonna do one more of my questions and then I will turn it to other people. Um, let's see, which, okay. So um, you write that in the most recent wave of activism, men or fathers have begun to join in. Can you talk about why this has happened? And if in a male dominated society like Mexico, will this make a difference? Yeah. You know, that's a question I struggle with. I think it's too soon to know if it's going to make a difference. Um, you know, there's only a few men that have been really part of the movement, like the, the um, 
it, it, it is somewhat gendered because um, the men will come on the searches where they can dig and carry and, you know, help in that regard. Um, you know, so, but it's, there is a gendered aspect. So we were told that the women are less likely to be, to be put in jail as mothers for speaking out. But if it's a guy, a man, typically there's a pattern evidently that those folks, those men will just be grabbed and thrown in jail. And so there's, there is a strategic crafting for why the mothers are at the forefront um, ah, okay. in, in that way. Hmm. All right, very interesting topic, I have to say. Okay, so let's get to some other questions. Um, we have a question from Brad Stone. Uh, motherist activism is an important rhetoric to study. You reminded me that Black Lives Matter was founded by mothers. Similarly, there are the mothers of the disappeared in Argentina. On the other hand, standard feminism, at least philosophical feminism, says little about it. Why is that? Is it perhaps due to the racial demographics of motherist activists? Hi, Brad. Thanks for your <laughs> question. I can't see you, but hi. Um, yeah, no, there, there's a lot of stuff in my field on motherist activism and feminist scholarship, for sure. Like you said, going back to Argentina and, and the Plaza de Mayo. Um, so I would contend that it's, it's, not, it's not something that's understudied, at least in my field. Um, but I love your link to Black Lives Matter. And um, I had forgotten that it was started by mothers as well. Um, so you know, in, in, and that's motherist activist, again, is Cynthia Bejarano's term. She's a criminal um, science uh, professor at the University of New Mexico. Um, and uh, it, it, it's also in my field because for decades, everything that was important were of men, speeches of men and white men. And so, you know, our canon has taken decades to, to even look at women as a figure to be studied and important to look at. So we, we still have a long way to go in that regard. Hmm. Very nice. um, another question from Nancy Pineda Madrid. Thank you for this work, so very important. Would you say more about the contrast new materialism with your border materialism? How does your border materialism serve to resist violence? Okay, so um, border materialism looks at the economic and social and polit political conditions that can give rise to violence, like looking at the, the cartels, looking at the maquiladoras, looking at the context and places and spaces that bodies inhabit, um, at least for, for my work, affords me a theoretical lens to, to interrogate that. Um, the chapter on objects, um, I argue that objects are not inherently um, given meaning without a context. So things have a context. So in look, I, I make a link to things, to those things that are produced on the Maquiladora assembly line um, and how those things are driven by capital. Um, and so I make a, a, a turn and deviate then from the new materialists and looking at how free trade and neoliberalism and these objects that women interact with give rise to these unsafe conditions um, anyway, so I try to do it in that way. Um, Dana Cloud asks, can you go over why the state and the capitalist firms want to silence the movement and deny the killings? Who benefits from the killing of these girls and women? Yeah, thank you, Dana. Um, so the, the um, Mexican government, um, I, I alluded to it, but they talk about the femicides as a dark legend, as a myth. And the reason for that, and I document it in one of the chapters, um, is solely driven by tourism and tourist capitalism. So they don't want Juarez to have a bad name, right? They don't want people to be afraid to come to Juarez, and especially on the border with El Paso with the college town, it used to be a thriving where, where people would cross back and forth and they would come over to Juarez and, you know, similar to Tijuana and San Diego here where, where we are. Um, but it absolutely hurts the Mexican government to um, have this as a stain. And I should point out that even when the Mexican government was found culpable 
or the femicides by the Inter-American Court on Human Rights, we see that the femicides continue. You know, so it's it's a it's a it's a job we've seen in in 2019 and 2020 the femicides not only have risen but they've spread throughout mexico so um we are seeing a rise unfortunately in the femicides versus um you know really having a handle on the movement um nancy asked another question do you see an increase in oh gosh i'm going to screw this up desapacions Today in Juarez, is feminicidio intensifying today through desapacion? Des, oh, I can't say that word. Can you, can you spell it for me? Yes, D-E-S-A-P-A-C-I-O-N-E-S. Desapaciones. Well, I would... I think the question was kind of what I was just talking about, about the numbers being on the rise. Is that the question? I think so. Yeah. Um, and the disappeared maybe is what they, they meant. Um, maybe she'll write me a better, uh, a more specific. <laughs> yeah, okay, I'll do my best. I'll do my best. Um, so I don't know why this is escaping me right now, but there was a big, a big march um, in relation to the femicides. I think it was, Brad that mentioned Argentina, mm -hmm. um, but it, it was it was a huge event. It happened after my book was published, but because of the spread of the feminicidios, there was a day, a strike, a national strike where women did not work, they did not do any labor, and that didn't get a lot of attention. Um, but it tells me that even in these other states, there are they are organizing yeah. um, in order to pull that off. Um, and so, and they, there have been solidarity with other Latin American countries to kind of form this hegemonic block. Um, so that's something I need to turn to and look more at, more closely at. Great, excellent. Um, okay, let's go to another question. What actions can we take here in the United States beyond the steps for simply raising awareness? Are there US-based or international organizations that work with the mother-led groups in Mexico? And that comes from Gabriela Davidson Gomez. Thank you for that question. Um, the, you know, when we ask the mothers, what can we do? They say over and over, tell the stories, tell the stories, circulate the stories. Um, so I've tried to bring in guest speakers in the past. We brought some of the mothers to campus in the past. Um, critical documentaries are uh, really, really important, I think, to get the word out. So consciousness raising, I mean, it's, it's amazing, but I still meet people that have never heard of the femicides. Um, and so, you know, the, because the movement has died down and so a new generation is just learning about what's happening, right? So there needs to be a lot of consciousness raising at this point. Um, there are not that I know of individual groups that work like a sister organization with the groups in Juarez. I don't, I don't believe so. Um, but you can, I follow their activism on Facebook and Instagram, like everybody else, you know, social media is really great because we can find a lot of, uh, find out a lot about what's being organized on the ground. And then often there'll be a call for a solidarity initiative. And so we've been using social media that way. Um. Uh, let's see. So, okay. Dana Cloud says, I'm in rhetoric too. Uh, in my view, a lot of people in the field basically call what they do materialism without engaging the material experience of these women and treating human beings as agents, which historical materialism does and Nina insists upon. Whoa. Uh, it is a theoretical perspective that says we need a reality check against the lies of the state and corporations. By the way, explain affect. Oh, affect. I, I was t um, talking about, okay, so first of all, thank you, Dana, for, for um, your words there to really concretize, I think, what I'm trying to, to get at. Um, so in the chapter of the murals, I talk about affect or emotion um, and how when telling, so, Yuvia is the artist and she interviews the mothers one by one to get all the details of their daughter's lives before we start painting the murals. Um, and so when the murals go up, I look at affect as emotion because in conducting my interviews, 
many of the people said that the murals, um, particularly this one with two young girls, that they are the guardians of the barrio. They are the guardians of the barrio, that they provide safety. Um, other folks have talked about the emotion of having their daughter with them. And so literally one of the men um, was sleeping right on the ground next to the mural, kind of touching Aww. the mural. Um, and so that how visual rhetoric can work to give rise to people that, that then learn that this is happening, it matters, we must take a stand. Um, and the murals through visual rhetoric, um, I try to talk about how that can happen. Um, and the mural project has been very successful. Yeah. Um, so John asks, in the book, you talk a bit about the careful balance between scholars who come into these communities and mothers. There is, as you mentioned, mistrust of scholars. Can you talk more about the scholar activist model and how, for our students, others should approach this work? Thank you. Um, can you repeat the beginning of that question yeah. again? In the book, you talk about the careful balance between scholars who come into these communities and the mothers. Okay, got it. okay, thanks. Um, so we were told early on, like in the early 2000s that, you know, and this is during the time that Hollywood was trying to sensationalize the femicides. Um, there was actually a Jane Fonda and Sally Fields came to Juarez and there was a performance of the vagina monologues. And I talk about this in the book that, you know, they wanted to raise awareness and get all these Hollywood people involved. Um, but the mothers were very offended by the content in the show and they stood up and walked out. So it was a disaster. And it's, it's an example of attempting to fix something or do something without having any knowledge at all from the people who are most affected. Um, you know, and so as a scholar activist, we can do that through different methodological tools. We can do it through ethnography. We can do it, you know, through interviews. We can do it through focus groups. Um, but I also believe that immersing oneself in the community, even when we took our LMU students, we always stayed with the families um, to understand their conditions um, and always followed their lead. Um, and so, you know, we, I, I in particular was very, very careful um, about, you know, getting the blessing kind of from everyone involved with this book, showing it to them ahead of time, getting feedback um, as a way to make it part of a process that isn't taking um, and then, you know, kind of one and done, these scholars would come and do interviews and then they would never talk about wars again, right? Yeah. It, would just, it would just look good on their resume. So it's that kind of tension, I think, um, if that answers it, hopefully. Yeah. yeah. Um, Brian Alexander has asked, I had the opportunity to be present on campus when you facilitated a panel with some of the mothers and students were, ex and, oh, with some of the mothers and students were extremely moved informed and transformed in that co-presence. Can you speak to the role students have played in your research and teaching when they could travel to Juarez with you and their responses and impact to your work? That's a good question. That's a great question. Thank you so much, Dean Alexander. Um, so the students, yeah, the students are so motivated, right? They've got the energy. Um, a lot of them are already doing service and activism on campus. Um, so when we were doing a lot of the work um, earlier on before the NARC awards really um, started escalating, um, I can cite a few examples where our students were just phenomenal. So there is a case I cite in my book of David Mesa who was um, tortured and put in jail and was uh, scapegoated for the murders, but the mothers knew that he was innocent. And so what the students um, and I did every single Friday we showed up at the Mexican consulate in Los Angeles protesting to get the release of David Mesa. Um, and so every single Friday, students would show up with signs and banners and making noise and making demands. Um, we, the students got the media to come and you know, follow what was going on. And after two years, he was finally released. Um, students in the past have also set up tables on our campus where they have sold items that the mothers made so then that money can go back into the movement, um, you know, participating in the, in the alternative break trips. 
Um, but I still get contacted from students that participated in the war as trips that make connections to so many things that are happening today. So, you know, hopefully one day um, we will be able to get the program back up. Hoping, yes. Um, so Brad asks, in one of your chapters, you discuss the counter, why they keep moving, counter presentation of disappeared or murdered women to dispel the association of these women with prostitution, including the use of confirmation or first communion photos. Could you say more about that strategy? Oh, wow, thank you. Um, yeah, so again, it's that tension between how the women are articulated by the state and how the, the family members want to articulate their, their bodies, right? Um, and so we did, I did note that many of the images that were put out by the mothers if their daughter was disappeared was of their first communion, um, it was their quinceanera, you know, it was something wholesome to show, to counter that this woman was not a prostitute. Um, and I should also say that it took a while, but then the, the rhetoric also shifted that it doesn't matter if you're a prostitute, right? It doesn't matter, that, that person matters. It doesn't mean that we can just say, well, they, my daughter wasn't a prostitute, so her life matter. And so it, it created this larger context of looking at what the rhetorical strategies were and being very careful um, in that way. So um, yeah, yeah, that was one, one thing that shifted. Yeah. Um, so Priscilla Moreno says, thank you so much for having this event. I remember the beginning stages of your research on this book. I'm so glad to see the success of it. I'd like to ask whether over time there has been a change in the mother's movement rhetoric or framing of the issue that has helped them gain more support. Well, I, I mentioned the national strike. Um, was one. And then um, the other movements that have been taking place in relation with solidarity with some of the other Latin American countries. I don't know why I'm drawing a blank, but it was the big march. Um, it, it was, it was like, it wasn't me too, but it was, it was something else and it's going to drive me crazy. Um, so, but yeah, and I know, thank you, Priscilla. Um, she and I met early, early on in my research when I was in the archives at um, the University of New Mexico. Um, but no, I, 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 don't, I don't think I've seen any radical shift in tactics, at least not now. Hmm. Um, one of the questions that uh, we also had from our team that just reminded me was, um, let's see, uh, where is it? I have to see. Uh, Wait, wait, I have it. Oh, uh, outside of the interviews you did with women, what additional resources did you consult and what other avenues of research are there on this topic? Oh, wow. Um, so I mentioned that the book is 17 years approximately of research. Um, I was very fortunate to have LMU support my research. I had a very supportive dean. Um, and so I was uh, supported through faculty grants um, some internal grants, some external grants. Um, and what I did was, um, was able to put that money towards individuals to help translate and transcribe text. So I'm conversant in Spanish, but I'm certainly not fluent. And especially when dealing with this topic, every word matters. Um, so I went through um, three dominant newspapers in Juarez and Chihuahua and studied those, had them delivered to LMU. Um, oh all the coverage of the femicides um, through those periodicals. Additionally, um, when I got one of the grants, I went to the University of New Mexico and went through the archives. There is an archive, and actually I'm gonna donate all of my research to this archive as well. Um, the Esther Canez Chavo um, archive, she was one of the first person to have a domestic violence a rape crisis center in Juarez. She's passed away, unfortunately since then. So I went to and spent much time in the archives going through. Um, I did a lot of interviews, but also being with, talking about being in the field um, and participating in the marches and in you know uh, the demonstrations um, and using the analysis of the signs, of the rhetoric, of the speeches, of you know, and so then going to the monuments, I looked at all the artifacts visually um, as well, and then finally um, talking about um, scholar activism, doing the searches for the bones. But I mean, there's so many things I looked at 
um, yeah. all around. I tried to look at as many angles as I could. Right, right, and you did. Um, to what extent are these feminicidios organized crime or individualized crime? And who are the perpetrators? And this comes from Dorotea Reiner. Hi, Dorotea. Yeah, um, so as I mentioned, there's all you know different forms, human trafficking, um, gang initiation. Um, you know, there's a saying, if you want to rape a woman, there's no better city than Ciudad Juarez because of impunity. The impunity exists, the impunity continues. And so, yes, there's organized crime, but there's also, I also argue that there's state-sponsored violence um, in relation to not providing safety for the, for the women um, and denying, right, denying um, the femicide altogether. Um, yeah. But there, there is a, a saying in relation to um, femicide and individuals, I think you mentioned. And so I did trace the rhetoric of um, some husbands who, if their wife was acting out, they started invoking the rhetoric of the femicide and they would say, hey, if you don't watch it, you're gonna end up in Lota Bravo, which is the place where the bodies are dumped. So the rhetoric traces what's happening with these larger structures into you know, the personal public private sphere, blending it um, and seeing how this, this discourse spills over into then intimate partner violence. Rhetoric is very important. We have seen what's happened with rhetoric here in our country the last four years, so yeah. I'm just saying. Um, how do the current U.S.-Mexico border relations affect mother's activism? This comes from Ashley Bushhorn. Okay, thank you, Ashley. Um, it, you know, it's, I talk about this in my book too, because I can easily go back and forth, right? I can navigate the border. Many of the people there cannot. So when we had the caravan for justice, we were really limited because some people didn't have papers. Some, I mean, I'm, I'm against, I should say, I'm against all borders. So I'm like, no borders, I, I'm, you know, um, that is where I stand politically, um, just to get that out there. But uh, we really did run into problems when we, we tried to go and like we were protesting the coverage El Diario is a big newspaper in Juarez, and they have their, um, but their their big offices in El Paso, um, and so we were having demonstrations there at at that building. But we couldn't get a lot of the the women, you know, weren't able to be present and to cross. And so I talk about the limits of borders and and the problematics of borders, um, whereas, and I juxtapose it with these corporations. Right, they can come and go all they want in capital, like and thinking of capital, right? So these maquilas can move, they can shift, um, and so I, again, I try to look at capitalism in relation to um, borders and bodies. It always comes down to money. Um, outside of, um, let's see, right? Okay, what kind of resistance did you encounter during the research process? Mm. Yeah. <laughs> Well, um, it's, you know, it, it's not for the faint at heart um, because, you know, essentially every time we'd go out and have a protest, the, the military was there with their machine guns and, you know, a constantly survey us. We were under surveillance, um, you know, the oh entire God. time. Um, we tried to mitigate that risk by bringing in media because that's one of the, th the things I learned that if you have a spotlight, a US spotlight, you can use that privilege because there's less likely to be an incident because the whole world is kind of watching, right? right. Yeah. So um, we mitigated that, but um, yeah, I mean, so many blockades, I, I can't even think of, you know, all the resistance and the, 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 it's in the book, but you know, there have been so many women that have been killed by the government for speaking out. Um, literally assassinated. Um, and those are documented as well as many journalists that have been trying to speak out against the corruption are simply killed. Um, and so the strategy of purgation, um, you know, is, is real as far as trying to silence protesters as a last result. Um, so yeah, there's so, so many suppression strategies by the state. Um, and I try to trace those as well. Um, you know, silencing the women and, you know, all of their strategies. Amazing. Um, you, met, you mentioned that the perceptions of the media, of the issue of the media fall short. Um, what additional resources do you recommend for students who want to know more? Yeah, well, I'm, um, 
when I went to Juarez recently, I had the privilege of traveling with two documentarians. Um, they're in the process of completing their documentary. It's not out yet, but I am so, so excited because oh. they spent years and years in Juarez as well and were in our, our, our cohort. Um, so I, I know their work is going to be solid. Um, it's not out yet. Um, the one that people tend to show in classrooms is Senorita Extraviata. Um, and so a lot of people have learned um, about the femicides in that regard. Um, but, you know, the, the mini driver was in the movie um, about the femicides. And what was really horrifying um, is that at the end of the plot of the Hollywood movie, the person responsible for the femicides was an activist. They literally had the killer as an activist. I mean, it was, it was horrific, you know? And so we need more counter narratives and more, and you know, again, I'm a big believer in critical documentaries. Um, so I'm hoping that their documentary comes out soon and then I can blast it everywhere. <laughs> well, needless to say, um, we do have the documentary that you talked about in the library and um, the Senorita Extravita. And um, I look forward to this other documentary. So when it comes out, do let me know. I will. You know, I will add it to our collection. Yes. Um, so I think, um, let's see, do you have the energy for one more question? Sure. Okay. Um, so you write that in the most recent wave of activism, oh no, wait, I don't wanna do that, I'm sorry. Are you planning to continue this research? And if so, what are your next steps or projects? Thank you. Um, it was a really hard topic. Um, and so just for my own mental health, I've taken a break um, since the book was published. Um, and right now, when I, yeah, I'm gonna continue the work. Um, right now I'm thinking about talking about asylum, um, gendered violence and asylum cases. Um, and so that's where I'm going next, but I, that will be a journal article. It won't be a full length book but asylum cases and femicide there's really not there's really not a lot on it and there are so many asylum cases that are not being heard that people then go back and get killed there's no legal precedent for femicide and asylum so that's what i'm working on next excellent excellent um so uh just a note to everybody that um your we do have your book in the library and it is uh a um, available user access for unlimited so people can get it in the library and can read it and that's an ebook format um, so that's yay so everybody be sure you uh, take a look at that and um, I would like to thank you very much for being here and sharing this time with us and sharing your work with us it truly is very um, not known enough by people and it is very disturbing and people should know more. And so I really thank you for, for taking up this cause and doing this for us. Thank you. Um, it's all about the mothers. It's all about getting the stories out from the activists and the families. That's yeah. what it's about. Yes, it, yes, it's always about the mothers. <laughs> <Yep>. <laughs> um, thank you all for joining us on this special evening. Um, we want to thank our Dean, Christine Brancolini, for her continual support of the Handon Library's uh, fabulous programming that we do all year round. And I hope that you will all join us um, on Tuesday, November 10th at 5 p.m. when we will feature Professor Jason Jarvis, Associate Professor of Communication Studies, who will talk about his unique project, Greenwashing, the Visual Politics of Oil in Southern California. So uh, as a last note, when you leave Zoom, um, you will see a very short survey that will pop up once you leave the program. And we ask you just to take a minute, it's very short, to fill it out and that will help us plan our, and improve uh, future programming. So thanks again, Dr. Nina Lozano. And you, it's lovely seeing you again and it's been way too long. I and um, uh, Please enjoy the rest of your evening, everybody, and we'll see you next month. Thank, Thank you, you all. Thank you.